Okay, guys, I have got an absolute legend with me today. I've had legends on before. Really? I've, really? Had, <laughs> I've had legends on before, but this is truly a legend. Peter Hooten from the iconic band The Farm. Welcome to the show. How do you answer that? You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, welcome. Yeah. Welcome to my room. <laughs> welcome to my world. <laughs> Yeah. Peter, yeah, oh wow, I mean, it's just great having you on, um, we're both huge Liverpool fans, of course, and this is a Liverpool channel, but I also like culture, I like history, I like yeah. talk. I like talking, and I love Liverpool, but yeah, yeah. We, we go way back to the 80s, obviously, I, I've, I've done a little bit of checking on you, you know, and a few don't YouTube, believe anything you read don't on don't believe internet. anything you anything. read, it's all <laughs> bullshit, it's all bollocks, you're right, yeah. but we go back to the early 80s. I think you, John Peel, I think, was involved. I seen in one of the interviews, which is he's had a magazine, Fanzine. Yeah. Iconic, yeah. it became the end. Yeah, yeah. It was just a laugh. I mean, really, I was, I was youth worker at the time, and basically, no one could. The estate I was given was saying, you get on with it because the police couldn't deal with it, <laughs> probation couldn't deal with it. And said, you're a youth worker, detached youth worker. So I was a street worker, basically. Wow. But I knew a few lads on the estate through the football. I thought uh, it'd be good to start like a magazine, a fanzine, you know, and that's how we started it, really. One of, one of the lads did a, a mod fanzine called Time for Action. Uh, big Jam fans, we were all big Jam fans. We all went yeah. to see the Jam and the Clash yeah. and all that, you know. So I got in touch with them and said, would you fancy writing something? And we said, well, yeah, let's have a go. But we were deliberately aiming at it, uh, football fans, you know. Even though there's hardly any football in it, basically it was just an attack on everyone we knew, you know, everyone we knew and everyone in the media, and we just attacked everyone. And the idea was that the yeah. way you'd have a laugh in the pub. I didn't think any Liverpool uh, magazine at the time had that type of vicious humour, and that's yeah. what it, that's what it is. And like John Lennon always used to talk about that. He said it's a very very cruel humour, and I suppose it's very similar to Irish humour. I think you know, it was all yeah. it all emanated from yeah. the docks, probably. You know, and yeah. most people who worked on the docks were Irish descent. You know, so every no one suffered any fools. No one could get too big for the boots. Exactly. So we decided with the magazine that we'd attack everyone. So anyone who thought they were like a bit of a bit of a media personality or a legend, I would have been. <laughs> Target for the end. <laughs> Number yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Professional scouser. Yeah. You know, and, uh, so we attacked everything. But it, the the idea was, no, it was very tongue-in-cheek. The idea was to make people laugh. It wasn't, we didn't set out to upset people, you know. We upset a lot of people, like, but uh, we didn't <laughs> deliberately do that. We just thought, they're the type of people you'd see, you know, like a local radio DJ walking the yeah. pub. You'd take the piss out of them. <laughs> so we were trying to, but we never, what we're proud of in the magazine, we, we never had one joke in the magazine. There was never one joke. There was, we never, there was no jokes or it was all observational humor. Yeah. So it was yeah. about I, lo bouncers. I, lo I love observational humor, actually. That's the one I like. I yeah. like that. So it was all about bouncers, all about people at the match that we had various characters that don't let on crew, people who, you know, were. Uh, the uh, ticket touts got the piss taken out of them, you know. Right. Uh, taxi drivers, um, <laughs> big time Charlies, you know. Oh, fuck it. So it was, we just attacked everyone, but some some people did get upset by it, you know. But um, I didn't know at the time. It was only years later. People said, "Oh, my, my dad was a radio DJ then, and he really used to he used to get upset by you slagging him off all the time. <laughs> Come on, crying. We never even thought he'd read it." You know, we win, you know, we win. We think he'll never read this, you know. So it got big, though, didn't it? It, it took off. It got though. fairly big, probably because the likes of John Peel championed it yeah. on his show, and uh, we used to take the piss out of it, every football fan, you know, around the country, you know. And uh, the idea, the more we took the piss out of Leeds fans, the more we wanted to read it. It was like a self perpetuating thing, you know. Yeah. And we were saying Leeds fans dressed like this. They had Leeds gloves, and and we got a bit of a following in Leeds, you know. And um, years later, when the farm played there, 
a load of Leeds fans turned up. I thought, oh no, they're here to get us, you know, they're here <laughs> to batter us. But it wasn't. It's because they were fans at the end. Wow. But it was wow. almost like the more we attacked them, the more they liked the magazine and they'd write yeah. in and say, yeah. you know, that's wrong. I used to get all sorts of letters in from the Derby Leicester Alliance, right? Uh, wrote in once. We didn't think it existed. And so we, we, we got friends with these Leicester lads in the last few years. And we said that we got a letter off this, these fellas saying the Derby Leicester Alliance against Forest. He went, oh, yeah, that existed. Yeah. We couldn't believe it. We, we were laughing about it, you know. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what? As you say, the football is tribal. I mean, it was, especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I mean, it was, you know. It's really yeah, tried. It vicious. It was vicious. Wasn't it, it was, yeah, I mean, you see the film The Farm. If you ever seen that film, I'm sure, like, you know, you were at the games. The Farm or The Farm. No, The Farm. The firm. Yeah, yeah. The Farm, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a good. Uh, our manager, Kevin Sampson, did uh, a, a low budget film called Away Days. Mm. I think that was one of the more accurate ones. I think a lot of those ones based in London and that, it, it was all about, you know, we, you know, we never run from the. And, just nonsense, isn't it? You know, but <laughs> I think the um, we just took the piss out of football hooligans, even yeah. though we were aiming it at football hooligans. If you know what yeah, I mean, yeah, they deserved so, it. They deserved it. A lot of people uh, who read the magazine were that type of person, you know. Yeah, uh, I always remember one of our um, proudest moments was when the leader of the National Front in Liverpool, who used to struggle to sell. The NF News on Church Street in Liverpool City Centre when he wasn't getting attacked. You know, he'd, he'd sell maybe 50 copies. When he found out we were selling 5,000 copies, he knew he knew us anyway, but he, he'd say like things like, they're indoctrinating the youth of Liverpool with, with the uh, left wing pink uh, ideas. Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, towards socialism, that was the greatest, socialism. That was the greatest compliment <laughs> we could have got, you know. Yeah, I know. But that's the thing, though. Back in the 80s, people don't understand. When you look at the TikTok fans, I call them now, you know, follow Liverpool in the last two, three years, probably, you know, Instagram yeah. and social media. You know yourself, you do be on Twitter quite a bit. Yeah. It can be a crazy, oh, crazy place at times. It's not the real you know? world, is it? It's it's no, a, it's, a, it's, it's toxic, not, isn't it? It's toxic. You can never get a barometer from Twitter. I mean, Twitter and, and Facebook, they are great. You know, if you if you're trying to get people to a meeting or you're trying to get people to a demonstration, yeah. they're fantastic. And if you're trying to sell a book or anything, or yeah. you're trying to get people to listen to your podcasts or you know YouTube, it's fantastic. But don't ever. You know, don't ever take treat it as a barometer. Don't take it seriously. No, no, it's fucking absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You're, fucking, you're right. You're right. But the other thing is, okay, so the end really took off. I Was that was that a catalyst to the farm, do you think? Are you in music? It, it made was, me, or would have, you know. In a way, it was, it made me more confident to, uh, yeah. you know, to do something. And also, because I, I was doing the end, uh, you know, I thought, well, I'd never intended to join a, a group. It was just by pure chance, you know. So just uh, we're in my mate's pub one day, his mum run this pub. And I said, what's that noise? It was when they used to shut in the afternoon for licensing hours. I don't know if it was like that in a, in a, in, uh, was, uh, in was, but it, it was to yeah. do with the First World War. <laughs> you couldn't get the... Uh, you couldn't get the people to go back to the armaments factories from the oh, yeah. pub. So they ended yeah. up shutting the pub between three... And five or whatever. So, but wow. anyway, on a Sunday, I had this group playing, and uh, I said, "What's that?" I said, "Oh, that's our kid. He's got a group." So I went in to listen to them, and they were like, "They were okay, you know." But uh, I said, "Where's your singing?" So oh, we haven't got one. I said, oh, "I'll have a go." I was, you know, I used to sing for me relatives at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you like me? You like me? <laughs> I used to oh, sing yeah. for them because everyone would sit round and. Yeah, it's probably an Irish tradition, but everyone would sit around and sing mad songs, you know. It is, yeah. It and is. Um, I used to, I was one of the only kids who'd do it, but I'd sing, um, I'd usually sing somewhere from West Side Story because you I, know knew I'd get, you, I'll stop I knew I'd get some money off my relatives. Do you know that song, Somewhere from yeah. West Side Story? My mother passed away six years ago, almost uh, in October. Yeah. The week, the week club came in actually in, in yeah, October yeah. 15. That was the song she played at her funeral. That well, was her favorite had, song. She somewhere good, she's a good judge. Yeah, somewhere. It's a fantastic song, yeah. What a song! What a it singer! Is a place for us. <laughs> it was great. Oh, don't, uh, worry. don't have me singing, but go on. 
Yeah, it was. It, you know, I loved West Side Story. I mean, basically, it's oh. Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? Yeah, it's Romeo yeah. and Juliet yeah. in the modern age, and I've always been fascinated with that. And like, um, you know, over the years, there's been a few films with those themes. You know, and I suppose altogether now it's the same theme. If you think yeah. about it, yeah, about yeah. Uh, war and factions coming together. You know. The thing about the farm, I, I've done a little, little checkup on him. Obviously, I know him because I, I was born in 73. So yeah, I would have been about 16, 17, you know, when you were big in 1990. So yeah, I was Played still in the school. Yeah. yeah, the SFX. You were over Dublin a few times. Um yeah, so, yeah. So I mean, Ireland, Dublin and, and Liverpool are like like brothers and sisters, really. I mean, historically, anyway, both port cities and the immigration, and as you know, there's a lot of surnames, Irish surnames in Liverpool. Yeah, but, yeah. But the big thing for me with, with the farm, I mean, did you influence the likes of the Stone Roses? Or are you around the same time as the Stone Roses? No, I think, no, we were um, we were about the same time, really, you know. But I certainly think uh, the look we had, yeah. that we had in the, in the mid-80s, was certainly a look that other groups looked at and saw. Yeah. Yeah. They can do it. We can do it. Sean Riders told me that. You know, Happy Mondays, movies. yeah. We were on a few shows at the time. Uh, we were on the Oxford Road show, which was a recommendation. Uh, John Peel recommended us for it uh, through Peter Powell, who, who introduced yeah. the Oxford Road show. And that's where the end was on as well. And that's where we wow. met Madness. We met Madness at one of those shows. So I think that look that we had was, was only really um, became mainstream with Oasis, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I know, you know, Alan McGee said to us in the past, you know, bought us drinks and said, that's for Oasis. Because he definitely looked at the farm and thought, that could be massive. You know, it could be like the jam, you know. Yeah. It, because it, it was a working class, uh, you know, people's lyrics singing, uh, lyrics about, you know, meaningful things, you know, not just throw away. And there was, according to the record companies, we didn't have an image. And we were trying to say to them, this is the biggest image you could ever have. Yeah. You just don't Little know did it. They know. Little did they know. So now everyone associates the cagoules and and jackets like that with Liam Gallagher, don't they? But yeah. you know, the farm was doing that 10 years before them, you know. No, that's brilliant. And I also, is this true that Oasis, before they were Oasis, I think they were called Real People or something like that. No, the Real People... Uh, were with uh, they nurtured Oasis, uh, Oasis when they were called Rain, I think. Okay, um, and were they meant to be back in group to use at one stage? No, no, the act, Oasis were uh, rehearsing with the real people in Liverpool, and um, he said, Oh, we've got this group who look like they just look like you, they love you, they're great. You know, they're trying to cut, you know, they're, they're trying to be like yeah. you because yeah. we were big, you know, we were massive at the time, we just had a number one album. Wow, he said, They want to support you, um. And I said, we've already got a tour support. So they never got on it. But that ended up being Oasis. And the real people were never real. The real people were written out of the story with Oasis. But if you do go onto YouTube and you look at the real people, you'll hear some of the, uh, some of the interviews they've done recently and they're playing demo tapes of the early stuff and how yeah. they, they nurtured them. The real people in about 88, I thought were going to be as big as the Lars or someone, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, unfortunately, they signed to Columbia or CBS, uh, um, and basically the record company got hold of them. And because Acid House was kicking off, they, they sort of like stopped them from releasing stuff because their their style was more like Oasis, you know, that style yeah, of music. Yeah. Ballads and great songs. And so they, they sat on them for 18 months, two years. But by that time, it had all gone, you know. And by you know the you know they never really got the break they deserved, you know. So what was it like, um, Peter? Um, when you were big, I'm talking about Spartacus album. We, uh, you know, all together now, groovy train. When you were like top of the pops level, I mean, it was shite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, thinks, I don't fucking remember. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, everyone thinks. At the time, <laughs> it's it it was like such it was like a tidal wave, you know. Yeah. Earlier on in that year, nineteen ninety, we were just trying to set up a, a small independent label, you know, with a bit of money. Uh, by no Christmas, we were 
battling for the number one. So we couldn't really appreciate it because there was no plan. Yeah, everything was done. It was like a punk rock experiment, you know, and like things were happening. And Jamie Reed, who did the uh, punk, you know, the uh, Sex Pistols front cover with the Queen on, um, he came into the office. He was the art artwork for the, artwork for the Pistols, and he come in and saw the chaos in the office. He went, "This is punk rock. This is what it was supposed to be like." Unfortunately, because we was licensing the records all around the world to half of them were to bootleggers, we didn't know half of them were, you know. And For fuck's sake. So I mean it was when it was say obviously we enjoyed it. I mean, we enjoyed it like it was our last week on earth. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how we enjoyed it. But you can't really mm. appreciate it at the time because there's so much going on and so much pressure. It was only really till we were touring America in 94, I think it was. And then I realised that, you know, it's coming to its end here, this, you know, this sort of like, this first wave of, of, of what had happened. And I thought, you know, let's just enjoy it. So I enjoyed the American tour in 94 more than anything, you know, because mm. I just sat back and thought, on my days off, I'm going to go to the Rockies in Den by Denver and I'm going to go up and we're going to enjoy it. And I'm going to... I'm going to see mountain lions and bears and things you'd never dreamt of seeing. But during that period when we were mega successful, it was confusing, if I tell you the truth, because it was so chaotic. That, whirlwind, you know, whirlwind, wasn't it? It was a whirlwind, yeah. And yeah. I think, uh, I'm not complaining, but, you know, to, you know, what was it like? It was, it was like mad. It was mad, you know. I think we were on... The verge of nervous breakdown, some of us sometimes, you know. And like it was like, it was know, like we, the old rock and roll, wasn't it? Yeah, you we know, were drinking too you know, much. We were yeah. taking yeah. too much of everything. And uh the worst one, we went to failure in ninety one. It wasn't yeah, say the no. worst, it was the best. Yeah, we went crack, to failure in ninety one and yeah. we were just out of control, you know. We were out of control, we'd lost the plot, you know. We were our uh, guitarists threw a monitor down on one of the security. Oh, God. Who happened to be well connected with various political organizations? Yeah, we, so won't, say, to be, we won't say uh, anymore. We won't to be, say uh, anymore. You know, there was there was discussions anyway. That to be peacemakers and that. You know, <laughs> but after after the gig, we were in the the uh, you know backstage and the Mondays were like yeah. you know the Mondays were like oh my God, what's wrong with the farm? You know, because we had about a hundred people come over for the gig and it was like. It was like a football match, you know, and like <laughs> I don't think we covered ourselves in glory, yeah, but yeah. we did give all our t-shirts away for nothing. <laughs> for nothing, yeah. Uh, what happened was our one of our mates he got stopped in um, Belfast. He came on the, um, uh, the Lahn ferry, yeah, you know, and he got stopped at Belfast. He uh, got stopped in Lahn, and Special Branch had hold of him and said, "Yeah, you went to uh, you went to a troops out meeting." In 1986 or so. Oh, wow. And he went, what? He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm going to sell T-shirts for the farm. And he went, and you were at this um, you were at this meeting and that, you know. And he was. He was. He couldn't deny it because I don't know if he'd signed it or, you know, put his address or whatever. <laughs> but they had the fucking information. <laughs> anyway, he got back. He was pissed off. So he got to failure. We got to the um, the bar in the clubhouse and yeah. we started drinking a few Guinness so I had about three or four Guinness and I thought if I have any more I won't be able to too heavy tonight. they're too heavy yeah yeah <laughs> so heavy. I went back to the hotel but they all stayed there and the t-shirt fella stayed with the rest of the group and me and the drummer went back to the hotel and when we came back from the uh, from the hotel uh, everyone was blind drunk literally they were legless they could not walk we couldn't get the guitarist or the bass player to stand up. He couldn't oh stand up. God. And everyone had farm t-shirts on. I said to Mick, I said, fucking hell, I didn't think he'd be selling them to the concert. He went, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll just give them all away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my I, God. I, I, I'd say there's stories coming out. What are you doing? And he went, oh, you know, you're the farm, aren't you? Fucking give them all away. Farm them like, out. Farm them still out. Remember <laughs> it. People still remember it. But we were so drunk. <sighs> we had to rely upon... Uh, you know, the drummer and me. I sang Molly Malone oh. uh, as soon as I got on stage and I sang that for 10 minutes or something just to try and sober them bastards. Yeah. <laughs> it, was not, 
he was still like they didn't know where he was. I wonder if that's still on YouTube. I'll have to well, check. I don't think any, I've years. never seen any footage of it. But I remember we were out of control, and uh, I think Keith, the, who threw the monitor as well, he pissed on one of the Mondays uh, <laughs> guitar amps. You know, and it was it was all going a bit. You know, weird. Oh, you know. <laughs> I say people oh. after the gig were saying that's one of the greatest gigs we've ever come. Okay, now you'd only hear in like. Uh, the drums and the vocals. It was like yeah. no one else could really play. Oh you know? my god! It, it probably was like the old seventies, like the Sex Pistols or something. What they used to do. Uh, I don't know what the it was real like, rock we and were, roll. You know, we were, the, we were, the, you know, we were the toast of tailors. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, fair play to you. But before we talk about your other passion, which of course is Liverpool, yeah, this song, the famous song. Um, all together now. I didn't realize, even when I would have, everyone knows that song in Ireland, everyone knows it in the world, a famous song. Yeah. But when you're singing it, you know, you're in a dance in a nightclub, even years ago, you're not thinking it's a song, something to do with No Man's Land in World War One. Yeah, like it's, yeah, yeah. it's no, certainly not what you're thinking about, you know? No, it was definitely done with that intention. So when people heard it, you could see it as a party song. Yeah. Or, or an anti war song. Well, it's, a, it's an anti war song, you know, and Brilliant um, song. it was. I just wanted to, when I wrote it, it was in the 80s I wrote it, uh, before Paul McCartney's Pipe of Peace, fucking hell, when he come, brought that out. I remember, album, that's, oh, a Chris, like, that's a Christmas song, that is. <laughs> but, uh, when I read about this incident, I thought, why haven't I learned this? In You know, I'm a, I'd studied history, you know, so I was very keen yeah. on history. And when I read about this and started reading more into it, I thought, I'm going to be a champion for that. I'm going to, you know, Instead of hearing about the Battle of the Somme and the mm. horrors of the First World War, trenches, wow. I want to be championing that instance of humanity in the First World yeah. War. Uh, and so that's what I did. So it was like an advert for peace rather than, you know, and everyone knows what the First World War was about anyway. It was about colonialism, it was about imperialism, it was about. Everything that you it was know, futile, really, wasn't it? Futile, absolutely. Fu no absolutely. one can work it out. I mean, there's a great book by uh, uh, an author called Clark, and it's called uh, Sleepwalking, and it's how the European powers sleptwalked into, into the it. conflict. Into you know? it. And of course, there was lots of uh, people from Ireland who volunteered, not just from uh, young lads, young lads, yeah, yeah, 14, yeah because 15. you know, misguided or had yeah. the best intent, I don't know, but. Obviously, a lot of propaganda at the time, but you know, no one can find out or no one can work out really the real reason for it. It was basically yeah. about we the Germans are building a few more battleships, and they had a rule the British had, used to have they had to be two and a half big size, the Royal Navy had to be two and a half times the size of the nearest two nations put together, and that's France. And the Germans broke that rule. So they yeah. thought they're going to want part of the empire. You know, it's all imperialism, you know, and it's the futility of it. And I thought, and it was, I wrote it after uh, Michael Foote was at the Cenotaph and he was getting loads of criticism. For the Maybe coat he was wearing, wearing, wasn't it? The, don the donkey yeah, or jacket was, or something, wasn't it? Yeah, and I was thinking to myself, anyone who's in that war would be made up with yeah. the likes of Michael Foote telling the truth about what the First World War was about and what whatever he's got to... It came to pass later on. It was a right wing Labour MP who stitched oh, him up because wow. he didn't. Uh, yeah, he rung, rung the Daily Mail and said he was wearing a junk, donkey jacket. Yeah, it was a car coat from Harrods that the Queen Mother had complimented him on. <laughs> Listen, those rag, we, we won't later, mention those rag mags. We know the rag mags. We know. We'll the, mention that names. came out years later in his memoirs. I think you know the. Mm. Um, she complimented on it, so it just shows you how. And it's the same happened with Corbyn now, you know, uh, a few years yeah. ago, you know, but the right wing of the Labour Party, uh, probably the, you know, uh, the least progressive political organisation, you, you know, yeah, you could, know, you could yeah. know, because they stop every social change happening and then try and stitch everything, like what Starmer's doing to the Labour Party now, you know. Yeah. Saying going to the Lexel College where the MPs have blocked votes, you know, and trade unions rather than one member, one vote, because they don't want change, you know, it's the biggest. Uh, Obstacle yeah. to real social change, you know, to disgrace, like you know. And, and 
we know your, your music, we know you for your music, but a lot of people might know you for your activism. You're, you're very, you know, your, your, your good work, your charity work, Spirit of Shankly, you yeah. know, all these things, Leg the Beatles legacy. You're involved yeah, yeah. everywhere. Where do you get the time, Peter? Yeah, I don't know. Wow, man. I'm, I'm just like, I mean, the, I haven't campaigned for it. I mean, the Beatles legacy, they, you know, they, they just wanted me to do it, you know. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, you know, we don't, we only meet a couple of times a year, you know, it's not much work involved in it, you know, but at the moment I'm involved in a, um, a project for the BT Sports doing the Boot Room Boys. That's your book, so, isn't it? In a book? Yeah, the book, you the Boot Room Boys. Oh, so, Show it there. Show it up yeah, there. It's, um, it's basically about how Shankly transformed. Wow. Um, yeah. It's, you know, uh, I had to, I, I, my dad bought or my dad buys everything about Liverpool, you know. He's still alive, he's still in still goes to match, he's getting on a bit, you know, but he still goes to matches and but he's bought every player's book there's ever been. Well, so I had to read them all to do that book. But you know, I'd never read autobiographies or whatever, but yeah, it's fascinating to find out. I thought I knew a lot about Liverpool, but I only knew a fraction. You know, Shankly was had to fight every day of his life against the board because they were just dickheads you know they were like they were like uh, very f conservative didn't want to spend any money he wanted him to run the club on a shoestring and they'd seen what he'd done at Huddersfield they wanted him to he brought through Dennis Law at Huddersfield and yeah. uh, a couple of other players uh, Ray Wilson who ends up playing for Everton and he thought well he can if we can get him to nurture the youth we won't have to spend much money and he might get his promotion because Liverpool, of course, were in the second division. The so it 60s, all stems yeah. from without Shankly, there is not the Liverpool modern day club. It doesn't exist. You know? It doesn't exist. And Fagan then was exist. behind them as well. But that's the thing with Liverpool, people don't realise. I mean, I mean, could even go back to just a few years ago. Those Hicks and Gillette two cowboys. I mean, I know yeah, you were yeah. involved in uh trying when they were there. I mean, yeah. the club were in, the club were in deep trouble then. As you know, yeah, yeah. and a, you know, not many, not many people would protest. We only ever had five thousand people on the streets. So if you think about, that's like a tenth of the ground. Yeah, the other nine tenths sat on their hands or folding their arms, and most of the players wouldn't want to get involved because they didn't want to upset. You know, they were working the for the club the or they were working for LFC TV. You know, I, I, one of my uh, badge of honours is I got banned off LFC TV. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, Pearslow, who's now at um, Aston Villa. Yeah, Pearslow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He banned, he banned, he had a list of people. And Yo, it was a who's who of the uh, Spirits of Shankly. Oh, and my he said, God. Um, his, his right hand man had done a dossier on us. And he can still get the dossier on the internet. And he said, Spirits of Shankly are like the uh, the Kim Air Rouge of supporters group. You know? <laughs> You're on the terrorist <laughs> list. I think that's of football. A, that's a bad analogy, really, when you really think about yeah. it. But yeah. It was a badge of honour. Some people who were in the SOS who were very active, who weren't on that, were a bit shocked that they weren't on it, you know, because. But you're still going, aren't you? The Spirit of Shankly's still there, isn't it? Still going, yeah. We had, a, yeah. We had our AGM last week, and we deal a lot with. Uh, the club, I mean, the club have almost accepted us now. Yeah, that we're not going away, you know. So, uh, what, what do you think of the, What do you think of FSG then? Without being too, uh... Uh, you know, I think put it this way: compared to Hicks and Gillette, oh yeah, they're decent owners. But I can understand the frustration when they're not investing in the team yeah. and the squad and that. But you know, I think if you buy the league, there's not much glory in that. You know, whereas Liverpool, Liverpool won the league after buying Allison and uh, Van Dijk, which was important, of course. But we had to sell Coutinho to fund them. So mm. in a way, I can see FSG's model, but I just think they should be just a bit like Shankly used to argue with. Now we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Klopp could be arguing with them all the time. It's only when you read Shankly's autobiography and you read that. And he, and he says every day was a battle. Every day was a battle. He wanted to buy Jack Charlton for £20,000. He knocked him <laughs> Big back. Jack. Big, Jack. Big Jack. And he said, because they knocked him back, 
and Leeds kept hold of him. That made Leeds strong throughout the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. If Liverpool had got him, he said, Leeds wouldn't have been as strong as they were. So he said, these things come back to haunt you. He tried yeah. to buy Dennis Law. No go. And in the end, uh, he wanted to buy St. John and Yeats for Huddersfield originally. But they, they weren't interested because they were too much money. And then he'd come to Liverpool and he wanted to buy St. John and Yeats again. And the board said, they're not our players. They're Everton players. Oh, Everton can afford 30,000, 35,000. Liverpool can't afford that. So we buy you Gordon Mill. Now, Gordon Mill was a good player, yeah. a very good player. But him, yeah. he was 16,000 pounds. That's the type of fee Liverpool were involved in. It wasn't until, and this is the fate, really. Everton were the big club, of course. You know, they were the amazing millionaires. You know, everyone's yeah. heard about that. John Moores, who was from the Littlewoods Foundation, uh, Littlewoods yeah. organization, yeah. he had shares in Liverpool, yeah. but he was also had shares in Everton. But he was an Evertonian. So in 1960, he got voted onto the board of, um, of Everton, but he was also on the board of Liverpool. So he had to give up his, he had to nominate his shares in Liverpool and he nominated it to his chief of finance, Eric Sawyer. And as soon as Eric Sawyer came in, Shankly made a beeline for him. <laughs> so this is the financial director, Little was He'll be able to get me some money. And he made a beeline for him. And he got out, he got on like a house on fire with Eric Sawyer. Wow. So from Eric Sawyer, he said Eric Sawyer was the he changed everything. Eric Sawyer said to the board, We if Mr. Shankly wants these players, we can't afford not to get them, you know. And that changed the goalposts. So the irony is, because John Moores went to Everton and he was thinking Everton are going to be the big club. Wow. The universe, you know, the Everton yeah. are going to be the Real Madrid and you know in the future. He put his money on the wrong goals because Harry Catter, who was the Everton manager at the time, didn't have the drive and personality of Shankly. Shankly just, it was like a stage for Shankly. Shankly took, got in the middle of the stage and did a one man, you know, or, or, you know a one man yeah. show. Um, but all the time he was still arguing with the board, you know, it was only Eric Sawyer was his main eye. Harry Katchuk was a bit, you know, they won the league Everton in the early 60s, but and they won the Cup in 66, but Liverpool were on a trajectory that would just come to dwarf Everton. You know, and I think a lot of the a lot of the problems with Evertonians is they can't accept that, you know, it's their own board's fault. It's not Liverpool's <laughs> fault. It was the it was the fact that Shankly um set the foundations for a global club. And if you look at the club now, the two, you know, there's Liverpool, Man United, uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, and then, you know, maybe Bayern Munich at PSG. Yeah. But PSG yeah. and Man City are, are new money, aren't they? Yeah. What's the glory in winning something with new money? I, I think it's better to do what Liverpool are doing, where, you know, they're keeping a tight rein. Now, everyone's written Liverpool off for this league this season. And they might oh, be I right. Haven't. Oh, I haven't. I haven't. No, but the injuries might, you know, might well, come to haunt them, you know. Yeah, could, yeah. But, uh, the, but I think the team at the beginning of the season was probably stronger than the team in 2019, 2020. Correct. Because we've got Kanate. The only obviously big gap would be uh, losing Bernalden. Yeah. Losing Bernalden. But we have Harvey Elliott coming through. We're hoping that Kite is going to. He's injured again, isn't he? You he's know? injured again. He's fucking uh, he'd get injured listening to a farm album. That's how he'd get injured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. But, um, you know, put it this way. We haven't bought the league. You know, but yeah. we are we are in the top three or four wages payers. We're toured, I think. All about I, think we're toured. I think we're toured. You know, so I think the fact that the FSG have said, let's get all these players signed up for the next five years. Yeah. That's a massive... Commitment to the uh, to the club, isn't it? I mean, he, everyone would like to see Tillemans. Everyone would like to see Mbappe. You know, they would, but it's fantasy gonna happen. football. Gonna happen. And, you know, you're going to see now Mbappe, Neymar and Messi. It's the Harlem Globetrotters. They probably hate each other. They do hate they each probably, other. Uh, they probably won't play well together. You know, yeah. you need a bit of tension. Like yeah. Mane and Salah have had. Yeah. A bit of animosity and like, I want, I want to get... But you can't have them literally hating each other. And the only reason Ronaldo's gone to United for me 
is because Messi was going to PSG. So he was thinking, I'm not in the news. I'm not in the news. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, I think true. it's a terrible move for United, but yeah. only time will hopefully, tell. Hopefully it is. Well, only, he'll score goals. He'll score goals. He'll score goals. You he's know, he, he will score goals. But I think for, he's not for the future, is he? And the one thing Solskjaer needs, he doesn't need more attackers, does he? He needs a few people who've got a bit of nous at the back. I, I, I think you know you need a new manager, but that's another day's story. No, don't we don't want we... a new manager. Yeah, oh, we you want, want a ten-year contract? We want, him, <laughs> we want him to like just stay do enough just to keep his job. I know what you mean. Yeah, like last night when he got beaten by West Ham. Just do it. Yeah, ah, we don't care one, about the League Cup. I mean, um, you know, I didn't want West Ham to win. Well, I man, I was made up the one, obviously, but I was thinking that's putting more pressure on him. Yeah. You know, we're losing his job. We want. Solskjaer to carry on, yeah, carry on business as usual, you know. Do you know what? As well, uh, back in 1990, when we, we won the league the last time, and people are going, yeah. You would not have thought it would take another 30 years to get over the line, would you? No, there's you no would. chance. No people chance, people would have thought you were mad saying yeah. that, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, yeah, and it's you know, we went through some uh, poor times, you know, and it was like. It was interesting times because, you know, we were always there or thereabouts. We always had good cup runs and we had the treble with Julier, which was fantastic. 2001. The, uh, Istanbul with Rafa. And we, I think we were the best team in 2008, 2009. We should have won it. We, we should have won, won it. We should have won it now. Some people are being Rafa. Other people say, well, he shouldn't have been in that position because we were on the fourth or fifth wage bill at the time. You know, so he was punching yeah. above his weight. But I think a few... Crucial decisions, and we should have won it. I mean, we dismantled United at Old Trafford 4 1. 4 1. Yeah. You know, and we should have won it that year, yeah. <coughs> but what do you think of the man himself, the man of the moment, Jurgen Klopp? Uh, I mean, he's, he's right up there, isn't he? Has he's right there. up there with, he's a modern day Shankly for me, you know. Is he? Okay. Oh, yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. The fair, what he did is, he saw the team. Wow. And he must have thought, we need the spine of the team here. Yeah. We need a goalkeeper. We need a centre half. And we need, you know, somewhat, you know, the spine of the team is important. It's what, exactly what Shankly did. And it, you can, it, for me, it's very similar to Shankly because Shankly always used to talk about natural enthusiasm. You're nothing without it. Natural enthusiasm, you know. He said, if you, you know, if you're a player and you don't give 100%, you know, I'd lock him up. I'd put him in, <laughs> he said, I'd, lock, I'd put him in jail. You know, and, and, you know world, imagine Spiro, Klopp saying that. Yeah, you know, and Klopp but is um, a man manager as well, doesn't he? Arm around your type of manager, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, uh, very emotional, uh, and I think you know, intelligent, like Paisley, very intelligent. People like Paisley very and Fagan weren't really like that, but Shankly was. Shankly was. That's why I was. I'd say he's more like Shankly than anyone, really. You know, and he, he's got a great turn of phrase for everything. You know. And think, bear in mind, it's his second language. Yeah, he's brilliant. You know, he's oh. a fucking genius. He? He is a, he, I think he's a very intelligent man. Very yeah. deep. Just you know, imagine, deep. you know what, uh, you know, obviously, I know United, I know good United fans, and they were like desperate to get Klopp. They were desperate to oh, get yeah. Klopp, you know. Oh, yeah. And when we got him, they were absolutely sick because they knew what was coming. I heard Ferguson wasn't happy that we got him. Did you hear that? Yeah. Alex Ferguson <laughs> wasn't happy. <laughs> the classic one was Woodward had him in New York, didn't he? Yeah, I heard so, that, you know, yeah. you've got to think about this as being like the Disneyland of football, and that was it. Fucking hell, no chance, you know, because the, that's the worst thing he could have said to Klopp, you know, the Disneyland yeah. of football, you know. It's like because you look, you, know, you look at Klopp, I mean, the clubs he was at Dortmund were similar to Liverpool as well, you know, work, yeah, yeah. work a man's club, the fans, you'll never walk alone, and everything, so yeah. yeah. It was a nice transition yeah. there, you know? Yeah, and I think he liked the idea of the emo. It's a very emotional club, Liverpool, you know? It's very, you know, yeah. people wear the heart and the sleeve, you know? And that's why the imagery is all everywhere. The imagery on the cop, the imagery outside the ground. And the flags. Obviously, a lot of fans on Twitter don't like that. Or opposing fans. They don't like it because they, wa they want to be like that. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. I, I get a lot that. of hate, don't we? We get a lot of hate on 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 um, Twitter and everywhere. Yeah, but it's just to be laughed at, isn't it? Really, that you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's to be laughed at because you know, you look at a uh, you look. Everton was singing songs in the sixties. 
they were singing songs and they were at, they had flags and that, and because it never really took off for them because they never did well in Europe in the seventies, yeah. you know, and they won the league in sixty nine seventy, you know, and they were still a massive club then, and we thought, but if they'd have gone on to do more in Europe, they would have had that culture as well. But now they just reject it. But if you look at them in eighty five when they played Rapid Vienna, their whole end's full of flags. Yeah. You know, now yeah. they say cop eye behaviour, flags, cop eye. It, it's jealousy. It's, it's jealousy. jealousy. I mean, they had a good side in the 80s. You know what I mean? They had a very yeah, good yeah. side in the yeah. 80s, you know? Yeah. And you yeah. think they were a bit bitter because of the Heisel, the Heisel Stadium. Yeah, but I don't and, think... and the way they got banned, you know? Oh, you banned yeah, us from your... I don't think... Heisel was never mentioned in the 80s. Heisel only ever got mentioned... I remember when I was watching uh, Wimbledon versus Everton, last game of the season. I was in a Dublin pub. I think we yeah. were playing in Dublin and uh, Everton stayed up. You know, when the goalie dived over the ball, remember that one? I was suspicious <laughs> of, uh, of uh, betting for the oh, team. Uh, Everton stayed up. Yeah. But then Evertonian started saying, How come we're nearly relegated? It's the fucking red shite. It's their yeah. fault. Blame everybody. When really, else. it was, you know, the t- their team broke up, it was breaking up anyway. You know, Kendall was at a, a drink problem, you know, and. You know, it never, it, Heisel was never really mentioned in 87, 88, 89, 90. It was mentioned when they were nearly relegated. And that become a retrospective thing, you know. Um, you know, they might have gone on to, you know, to uh, do something in Europe. But Europe, Europe was a learning curve. They went straight out in 70, 71. Yeah. You know, they, went, they didn't do well. They did, I think they went out to Parathenaikos, I think. I think it might have been quarter or semis, I don't know, but they did you know they didn't get to the final anyway. But um I think a lot of it's it's excuse after excuse. They have got to look at the way their own boards run and the yeah. way it, you know to it's easy to blame Liverpool. And it's 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 tiresome, isn't it? It's just a bit of jealousy as well. It's jealousy, you know. Stanley Park between them, it's just jealousy. Their stadium is in absolute ribbons at the moment. I know there's a new stadium probably coming. They're probably yeah. looking at Anfield being Renovated and being yeah, done up, the new Anfield yeah. Road expansion. And also, and you know? I think you know the very fact that Rafa's gone. A lot of them didn't want Rafa, of course he didn't. No. But then when he started winning a few games, you go, yeah, I seen it all over Twitter. About time we had a lucky manager, uh, you know. And I think you, you can't even celebrate a victory without having it a reference to, you know, Istanbul or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was thinking. So at the end of the night when they got beat. On pens by QPR. <laughs> Last and, night, uh, he's not that lucky, you know. <laughs> I was treating all me. Agent uh, Rafa. Is that what you call him? Agent yeah, not Rafa. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Well, yeah I mean, he's a professional manager and he'll do okay. But, you know, it's it's the way that, you know, they've got to look at their own board. Yeah, he'll keep them afloat, as they say. Mm. Well, yeah. just, just before we go, uh, Pete, this has been a great chat. I could chat to you all night, to be fair. Um, what do you think for Liverpool for this season? But what do you think? What do you think we do? I know the spine of the team is so important that it stays fit. Yeah, because we don't I think have be, the biggest I, squad, you know. I think if you if you finish above Liverpool, you win the league. Yeah, uh, good answer. I'm not predicting we'll win the league, but I think we'd be there or thereabouts. I think obviously the games against, I mean Chelsea. I think we should have beat Chelsea. Yeah, and you can see the way che- you can see the way Chelsea reacted at the end final whistle. How good do you think Liverpool are? Yeah. They were celebrating like they won the European Cup again. Fuck it. So, uh, those games against City are going to be massive. So we coming can, up, you coming know, up soon, we is it two weeks? Two weeks? Yeah, October the 3rd. If we can avoid defeat against City and maybe win one of them, you know, I think we're there or thereabouts and could possibly... It's It all depends. If we keep Salah and Mane fit, that's so important, you know, uh, keeping them fit. I think Fabinho is very important. Oh, Fabinho! You've got Allison. I believe that's the spine. Alan, They're calling the spine out here. Allison, Van Dijk, Fabinho, Fabinho, and Salah. If we keep them fit, that's the spine. We're there. We're 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 cha- You know, we're there over there. So Mo Salah. Before we're going to go now in a minute. Mo Salah. What a bl- his record. I tell you, he's he more records than the farm. He's more records than the farm. That guy he, is I mean, just what, you know unbelievable. The thing about Mo Salah is it's so effortless. You know, it's so it looks so easy, and that's what 
all the great players make it look like. I mean, Messi looks yeah. as if he's on the park, doesn't he? Mo Salah looks like he's running in the park with a load of kids, yeah. you know. And you just think, how's he done that? How's he got that? You know, and it's yeah, he it doesn't seem, you know, his little legs. He doesn't seem to be that fast, but he's fast. Oh, he's and fast. It, it's all up there, you know. And um, you know the get the the volley against QPR. You know, it's just perfection, wasn't it? You know, and he just seems to be hitting the back of the net all the time. You know, I just yeah. wish. Mane's had the shooting boots on a bit more. And I think that'll come because Mane's doing every Mane must be an absolute nightmare to play against. But it's just his final shot now. He's trying too hard, I think, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Just trying a bit too hard. And then we got you know, Jota as well. And then Origi's like a man possessed. Last I did not know he was in the squad two weeks ago. He wasn't in the 20 two weeks ago. So I don't know what's happened to him. You know, maybe he's had the ultimate, he's realized I'm not going. And he's really put his head down in training, you know. Yeah. But I mean, he can be a secret weapon in the Carabao and even in Europe, you know. And but he's also an option, you know. And with Bobby Firmino coming back from injury as well. So. Well, I mean, I, I like Bobby. I mean, a lot of people were. I think Bobby. You only miss Bobby when he's not, you know, when he's not playing. He's not there. It's like yeah. Henderson. Hendo, Henderson's yeah. missed when he's not playing because you think, where's the energy? Where's the, you know, and like. Yeah, I think there's certain players who are very underrated. Ronnie Whelan used to be one of them. Wow, Ronnie what Whelan, a player. he the, was what a player, what a player he was. but he was underrated. Um, yeah, so I think you know, I think it's looking good. I mean, the way we've started, I mean, as I say, um, it's great to be written off by everyone, all the pundits, because yeah. that's the way Liverpool like it, you know. And I think written off by everyone, but you. The acid test is, you know, if you know the way Chelsea celebrated the draw, because they know how good Liverpool are. Yeah, yeah. Two two shall know as being a German manager how good Klopp is. Let's be real, yeah. you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah, they know. Yeah. yeah. So things are rosy in the LFC Garden, uh, and I think they are. Yeah, yeah, I think they are. You know. So just before we go, Peter, have you went and planned for the rest of the year? Obviously, COVID's been a disaster for entertainment and music oh, yeah, we've in the got, last 18 months. We've got a few festivals still. The end of oh, the wow. Week. Real. Yeah, I don't know. I think they're going to be intense. I think they're going to be in marquees because one of them is in Sunderland in October, you know. You do know any that... over in Ireland? <laughs> Maybe no, we'd, lo we'd love to, but uh, no, we, we haven't got any plans, you know. Maybe maybe next yeah. summer, you never know. Well, you never know. I mean, someone's just got to get in touch with our agents and bookers, you know, but <laughs> we just tend to do, like, nostalgia um, festivals. Like, we're on, we're on, the one on Saturday we're on in Durham. We're playing with the Undertones. Oh, brilliant. They're brilliant, and, yeah. Um, a few other cast and the Happy Mondays and all that, you know, but it's, it's you know, it's all those type of... People who yeah. aren't having it anymore. You know, Doesn't you matter. Know. I love. We all love heritage, a bit of a nostalgia. Heritage groups, they call them. <laughs> legacy groups. <laughs> legacy, one, fans. legacy legacy fans. Legacy fans. Yeah, Peter, I've absolutely enjoyed that. You're you're an absolute legend, as I said before, and thank you very much for coming on. I wish you and your family all the best going forward, and stay safe, my friend. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, and um, see ya. You'll never walk alone. Cheers.